Today we're talking about the question, is the canon closed? You know, the 66 books of the, the Bible, is that it, or is it more? I, I've noticed over the last probably year or so, with my dealings with the LDS missionaries online, that is like the hot question that they open with. And I think it's because there are a lot of these missionaries that are connected with a guy by the name of Robert Boylan. Uh, he's a... LDS apologist, and he's written a book, Not by Scripture Alone. And they don't have to mention him, but I can tell that they're, they're just copying and pasting stuff from uh, his book, because that's their opening, opening thing, is, is that it? Is, is it just the 66 books of the Bible? And I, and I know where it's going. I know what, what, they've, got, what they've got to say next. And so we're going to cover that uh, kind of in, in a beginning phase today. But what we're going to look at is more for the person that's already figured it out, the, the Latter-day Saint who has done their homework, who has disobeyed every command and gone online and, and discovered that Joseph Smith was, you know, was a pervert. So let's just say that. That's, that's what he was, marrying young girls, um, crazy things, that, the, all the, the fraud that he was involved in. So that's who this is for. So that person that's already figured it out that Joseph Smith is not who he claimed to be, but they still have these lagging questions or nagging questions of, you know, is this it? Are we supposed to expect more? So the hardcore Latter-day Saint that just wants to believe it, none of what we cover today is going to uh, impact them probably whatsoever, unless the Holy Spirit is working on them, uh, of course. But for that person that is ready to, to receive, to understand, to ask questions sincerely, um, that's who it's for, and it'll, it'll impact them. We're going to look at a, a few things, and uh, what I want to look at first is, what is the motivation for an open canon? To have more than the 66 books of, of the Bible. I don't know about you guys, but uh, I've become a fan of podcasts with my job. I listen to podcasts all day long while I'm out delivering the mail, and I've gotten kind of hooked on true crime. Any other true crime uh, addicts out there? That's, I just love listening to them. And one of the things with true crime is that the investigators are always trying to discover what's the motive. Why did they commit the murder? Why did they commit the crime? And so when someone asks me whether they're a Latter-day Saint or a Roman Catholic or a Jehovah's Witness or whatever, and they ask that question, well, is the Bible canon closed? What's the motivation? And the motivation is actually pretty obvious, is that they want to add to it. They want more than the 66 books of the Bible. And so that is a very obvious motivation. Um, with, the, with these groups, the ones that kind of want to add to it, we're obviously talking about the Latter-day Saints, but the Roman Catholics believe the same thing, that the canon is not closed. That was one of the major things of the Reformation, sola scriptura. One of the main, main things of, of the Reformation was that, the, not the church, not the Catholic church, not, the, uh, not tradition, not the pope, but scripture alone. That's what the Reformers were teaching, and so the Roman Catholics want the canon to be, to be open. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, although if you ask them the question, do you believe in a closed canon, they would say yes. But functionally, that's not really true. Because they have their watch tower track and Bible society, all the, their uh, magazines that they hand out. Those are pretty much, in their mind, scripture as well. So it's not just the Bible. It's the Bible and their magazines and their, uh, the watch tower Bible and track uh, society. Roman Catholics, obviously, with tradition, uh, the Pope, and everything that goes uh, along with it. And there's some commonalities with groups that want to have more than the 66 uh, books of the Bible. Here are just a few, uh, four kind of commonalities. The canon must be open to introduce their unique doctrines. So groups that want to have an open canon all have doctrines that are not found in this, in the 66 books. And so the canon has to be open in order to introduce them. So uh, Mormons, Catholics, Jehovah's Witnesses, and whoever else, uh, that's one of their commonalities. Second, they all have a one true church mentality. So it's not just the Bible and their stuff, it's 
their stuff is the only stuff. And everybody else uh, is, is wrong. That's what they also have uh, in common. Uh, third thing is they pro- profess a belief in the Bible while having guns pulled out, pointed at it, and shoot it, shooting it, saying there's something wrong with it. Roman Catholics would say, this is dangerous. You can't have this by itself because if everyone's interpreting this for themselves, they're going to come up with all kinds of crazy things. And that's one of the accusations that Rome had against uh, Martin Luther. And Martin Luther said, well, that's, I'm kind of paraphrasing, but that's a risk worth taking to, to allow people to read it, to interpret it for uh, themselves. So they profess the Bible while having their guns pointed at it. With the Latter-day Saints, it's, yeah, we believe the Bible as far as it's translated correctly. And the obvious implication is that it is not translated correctly, and we need their organization to fix it. And the Book of Mormon fixes it, the Doctrine and Covenants fixes it, their modern-day prophets uh, fix it. So, yeah, they believe it, but it's messed up. There's something wrong with it. Uh, fourth, the Bible is subservient to the organization. Now, in a Christian church, in a Bible-believing church, this is above everything. So if your pastor says something that is wrong, this trumps the pastor. The pastor does not trump the book. However, in all of these isms, the leadership of the, the group trumps this. It's, that's certainly true with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. A lot of times you'll be talking with them, quote a verse to them that obviously contradicts something that they believe, their mind automatically goes to the conclusion, oh, that must be one of those verses that's been translated in, incorrectly. So the Bible is subservient to the organization. Now the reality is the Bible is progressive, right? You read Genesis 1.1, in the beginning was the Word, and, and not the, sorry, that's John 1.1. Genesis 1.1, God created everything. Now, does that tell us everything we need to know about, about God? It tells us a lot, but it doesn't tell us everything. So, Revelation is progressive, but it is not contradictory. So, each time a new revelation is going through, through the Bible, it's progressing. It's giving us more uh, information. Genesis 3.5, mispronounce it, the Proto-Evangelion, the, you know, the first mention of the Gospel, and you read Genesis 3.15, uh, it doesn't tell us who Jesus is, doesn't really tell us a whole lot about his life or his mission, it only tells us that the serpent is going to get his head crushed. Hmm, how is that going to play out? Well, progressive revelation tells us that, but it is never contradictory. So, if you have a new revelation that contradicts the old, the new revelation is wrong, but the Bible doesn't work doesn't work that way. The new revelation of all of these groups always contradicts uh, the, the, the revealed Word of God on important subjects like the nature of God, what salvation is, and how it happens. And as we've been looking in this class, we need to take those Bible warnings seriously. If you remember in Matthew seven fifteen, where Jesus said. Beware of false prophets who come as wolves in sheep's clothing. So we want to take those uh, warnings seriously. And we looked at 2 Corinthians 11, 3 and 4, where he talks about another Jesus, another spirit, and a different gospel. And if we're warned of another spirit, a different gospel, and a different Jesus, we should say, when someone says, yeah, I believe in Jesus, we should say, tell me about the Jesus you believe in. Give me a description. Tell me about the Holy Spirit you believe in. Tell me about the gospel you believe in. And if it contradicts what God has already revealed in his word, then it is not true. Revelation in the Bible is progressive, but it is never contradictory. So I'm very very suspicious on the onset of someone's motivation when they ask that question or bring up the question of, is the 66 book of the Bible, books of the Bible, is that it? Is the canon closed? Well, what is your motivation? Well, it's always to introduce new and unique doctrines that, let's just be honest, 100% of the time contradict uh, the already revealed uh, 
Word of God, whether it be Roman Catholics, Jehovah's Witnesses, Latter-day Saints, or, or what have you. The desire for an open canon, I've recognized over the last few years, is that there is a very strong unawareness of how complete of a story this book actually contains. So it usually comes in the form of, well, how, how do we know what we're supposed to do today? How is the church supposed to know how to function? How are we supposed to know anything if we don't have modern day prophets or modern scripture to tell us? Because, you know, this was written 2,000 years ago. It was finished 2,000 years ago. It doesn't apply to us directly uh, today. So it's what I, when I rec- what I recognize is a complete unawareness of how complete of a story the Bible is. And we'll talk about that here in just a moment. Again, my, my wife and I, or especially myself, are, is into those true, true crime podcasts. There's a show on Hulu. Uh, I don't know if I should endorse it or not in a, in a church, but uh, only murders in the building on Hulu. How many of you guys have watched that series? If you watch one episode, you will watch them all. I guarantee you, you'll get uh, hooked on it. It's with Steve Martin, Martin Short. I, I grew up in the 80s. That's when both of those guys were like just on the, on the, the top. So it's really funny. It's really intriguing. And every episode ends with a cliffhanger. So you think, all right, the show's almost over. I can go to bed, have a full night's sleep, and then it ends with a cliffhanger. You're like, oh my gosh, what is going to happen? I have to watch another episode. And then... Four episodes later, it's three in the morning, and I have to get up in, in two and a half hours. So they all end with cliffhangers. The Bible does not end in a cliffhanger. You're not reading in reading the book of Revelation going, now what? <laughs> it tells you what is going uh, to happen. So how complete of a story is the Bible? This is kind of a breakdown. It has a beginning. This is the simple thought. The Bible has a beginning. It has a middle and it has an end. It doesn't just have a beginning and a middle, and we don't know what's going to happen. It has a beginning, it has a middle, and an end. Genesis, the beginning, tells us where we came from. It answers those big questions of where we came from, why am I here, where, uh, am, I go- where am I going? That's what Genesis does. It begins the story for us. From Exodus Basically, tell Jude, from Exodus to Jude is the middle, but we can break that down into sections. From Exodus to Joshua, we're told, this is about the middle, what God requires of Israel for a relationship with him. So from Exodus to Joshua, he's saying to Israel, if you want to have a good relationship with me, this is what you got to do. And then from after Joshua, all the way through Malachi, is the, again, in that middle section, we have the story of Israel failing miserably at the requirements to have right relationship with him. But the cool thing is, is interspersed in that big middle section, we have prophecy after prophecy after prophecy of how God is going to fix that horrible problem of their failure. The prophecies of the Messiah coming, fulfilling the law, a new covenant. That would be a better covenant, all interspersed through that. And Malachi does end with a cliffhanger. What's the cliffhanger at the, end, the last verse in Malachi? Who remembers that cliffhanger? Gives us the cliffhanger of John the Baptist. It doesn't say John the Baptist, but it talks about the, the forerunner coming in. Someone turn all the way to the last chapter of Malachi. I think it's the last verse. Someone read that. So you just go to Matthew and go left one page. <laughs> and that's a 400-year page. Uh, my fingers are not working. Okay. Oh, verse 5 and 6, chapter 4. So that's a heck of a cliffhanger. You have this prophecy of Elijah the prophet coming. So for 400 years, Israel's like, where, where is he? Where is he? Where is he coming? That is a cliffhanger. But then we get to Matthew, 
And we have the fulfillment of those prophecies. So from Matthew to Acts, we have the fulfillment of all those prophecies, and we see the spread of the gospel, the new covenant that was promised in the Old Testament, that was going to be a better covenant than the old, because it was not based on the failures of man, or the, it was not based on the, the uh, ability of man to keep the law, because they failed, but on the ability of the Messiah who would fulfill the law for us. That's what we see in Matthew through Acts. So the big question that they have is, well, how does the church operate? How are we going to function if we don't have modern-day prophets, if we don't have modern-day uh, scripture? Well, who said we needed it? If you read, read simply from Romans to Jude, that is the section of the Bible that says, Church, this is how you are supposed to function. Uh, last couple of Sundays, or a few Sundays ago, uh, Pastor Jason did a, did a message on uh, children and parents. Remember that? That's functioning within, uh, within the church. Uh, last Sunday, he talked about you know, the first couple of verses in, in Philippians about uh, you know, joy and what's that, what that's supposed to look like. And, and thinking of others more than yourself. That's how the church, you and I, are supposed to function. You get to first, second, first, and second Timothy and Titus, and it tells us about elders and deacons and how the leadership is supposed to work uh, in the church. So we have that. The Bible tells us how the church is supposed to function. And then you get to Revelation. We have the end of the story. People are asking that question of, when is all this going to end? When is all the evil going to, to end? When is the Democrat Party going to be totally destroyed? Well, <laughs> read the book of Revelation, and it tells us what is going to happen. When, when that must promised Messiah returns, destroys all the bad, sets up his kingdom, which is an eternal kingdom, that the new heavens and new earth are, are created, and that we live for, for eternity with him. So the Bible is a complete story. It has a beginning, it has the middle, and it has the end. And so when someone asks, well, is this it? Is this is these 66 books? That tells you that they really don't have a clue of the contents of it, how deep this book is, how rich it is. Now, does the Bible tells us, tell us everything that there is to know, period? Of course not. It, it doesn't tell us everything, but it does tell us everything that we need to know. Here's a memory verse for you. Deuteronomy 29.29. Let's open up there. Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. This is a verse that's very applicable to this and to, uh, to other things. When anyone wants to talk about like lost books of the Bible or additional revelation, Maybe someone that thinks that they've got a revelation from God that should be added to it. This is a very uh, applicable passage or, or verse. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us. So the secret things belong to God. So there's a lot of stuff that he hasn't told us. There's probably you know, lots of questions you could you could ask or, or wonder of, wonder about that the Bible doesn't uh, tell us about. The secret things belong uh, to him, but the revealed things belong to us, and he has given us a lot. These 66 books, you will never, ever, ever reach the bottom of that well. You just won't. Now, I listened to uh, the Book of Mormon. I've gone through it a few times. I'm always listening to it, just so when they ask me, well, have you read it? Yes, yes, I have, Good. A, number of, a number of times. And it doesn't take long to get to the depth of the Book of Mormon. It, it's not very deep. It's a very shallow uh, well. But the, the Bible, man, that is deep. It is rich. You will never, ever get to the bottom. I've, I don't know how many commentaries I've read on, on the Book of John or listened to on the Book of John or other books of the Bible, but every time I listen to something new, I think, wow, I didn't pick up on that before. There's just so much, it's so deep. So the secret things belong to our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us. What exactly are we going to be doing in heaven? It doesn't tell us a whole heck of a lot 
uh, about it. What is heaven like? We get some, some details, some glimpses, but it doesn't tell us a whole lot. We'll learn later, but for now, those are the secret things that belong to God and what has what is revealed belong to us. We know heaven is real. It's a real place, and we're going there if you receive Jesus as your, your Lord and Savior. Uh, a couple other passages that are important for this discussion. And these ones, that we'll look at three of them. And th- these are ones that we, as Christians, honestly, we make a lot of mistakes with. Where, you, know, <laughs> uh, you think of someone in, in baseball, you know, when a, when a pitcher uh, messes up and they just they throw it right down the middle and they've got, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, I can't think of a Give me a home run, home run slugger, you know, Babe, Babe Ruth sees that pitch coming right down the middle. That, that, that one's going to get, get knocked out of the knocked out of the park. And sometimes we kind of set up uh, Latter Day Saints that we're talking with, and they're going to they're gonna, we're going to quote these verses, and we're, we're right and we're wrong in using them. How we use them oftentimes is very wrong, and so they're just like knocking our, our little comments uh, out of the park. And the first one, Second Timothy three sixteen and seventeen says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So we look at that and we say, okay, all Scripture in our brain, our our conservative Bible believing brains, we automatically think the sixty six books. And so in our brain, all scripture, those sixty six books are profitable for doctrine, for correction, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness. And we in our brain we're thinking slam dunk, they're not gonna have any any answer for it for it. But does that passage actually say that this is it? It just says all scripture. There could be more scripture, right? That's in their in their brain, so we've we've thrown the fastball or the slow ball right down the middle, and they're going to knock it uh, out of the park as soon as we quote that verse. However, uh, if you put the emphasis on the right syllable, <laughs> they will uh, understand what you're saying. So you say all scripture, everything that is actually scripture, is profitable for doctrine, for instruction, for correction. For instruction in, in uh, righteousness. Is the Book of Mormon scripture? No. Is the Doctrine and Covenants scripture? No. Is the Pope what comes out of his mouth? Scripture. Is the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society scripture? No. It doesn't qualify. And we'll look at some brief things in there. So you can use this verse, but use it rightly. Say, put the emphasis on the word scripture, everything that is actually scripture is profitable. And then you can, you can say something like, well, let's take some time. Let's compare the Bible and the qualities that it has with the qualities that the Book of Mormon has. And you'll see that they are not even comparable. And so those things do not qualify for scripture. Uh, someone read for us Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. So, again, there's this off time to quote this verse, and we're throwing that slow ball down the middle, and Babe Ruth is going to knock it out of the park. And their automatic trained response is to say, well, if that interpretation is true, then the Bible should have ended at Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2, because everything after that would be an addition, right? We've just lost the battle, right? No. You just got, you used the, right? You used the right verse, you just used it incorrectly. So, when it says that, do not add or take away, what that means is if God said something like, I don't know, I'm the first and the last, there's none before me, there's none after me, if God said that about himself, you do not add to that, you do not change it, you do not say, come along, and if someone claims to be a prophet comes along and says, no, you can actually become a God yourself. 
That's what it's contradicting. That's what it's forbidding. You know, if God says adultery is a sin, and someone come, comes along and says, God has commanded you to take multiple wives. No. That's adding to what God uh, has, has said. So another verse we do, it's similar to that. Someone turn to Revelation, or you can all turn there. Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19. So, as Bible-believing conservative Christians, that's the last, that's at the end of the story. And so we, we read where it says, do not add, uh, add to it. So in our brains, we think, okay, that's the end of the story. We don't add to it. It's not a Revelation 2.2. It's just, it's just it. That's where, where it ends. Well, we're using the right passage, but we're, again, we're, we're throwing down the slow pitch down the middle, and I'm going to knock it. Because we've used it incorrectly. What that means uh, simply is if God has said something, we do not change, add to it to what God has actually said. So if you're reading through through Revelation, it talks about God judging uh, people there in the last couple of ch- chapters as Jesus returns and sets up the, the, the setting up the millennial kingdom, and before that, the Bema seat, you know, the place of judgment. Sending, sending people, uh, un- unbelievers, to the, the fire and brimstone to eternal hell. And someone comes along and says, no, there's no hell. That would be adding to or changing what God has said. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's no more scripture. However, we have to fall back on the question of what is it that they're claiming this is to be scripture. And they have new stuff. We have to test the new stuff against what God has already said. If he has said certain things to be true, we do not contradict those. We do not change them. Uh, third thing I want to look at is, let's just say hypothetically that the canon is is open, that God can give more revelation, which he could. He's God. He can, uh, he can do that. I'm not anticipating it because he gave us the beginning, he gave us the middle, and he gave us the end, so I'm not, I'm not anticipating anything. But let's just be hypothetical and say the canon is open. Uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints does not just get a free pass to, to insert what they, they want. The Roman Catholics don't just get a free pass. The Jehovah's Witnesses don't just get a free pass. Or again, whoever wants to add to the scriptures does not just get a free pass. They have to uh, pass the same credibility test that all of these books. There's 66 individual books, and they all pass reasonable uh, tests of credibility. I want to read to you a statement. I'll probably read it twice. This is a lot in it. I probably should have put this on a piece of paper for you. But just listen carefully, and I'll, I'll read it twice. The church, talking about Christianity, not the Mormon church, the church did not determine which books were inspired. God did. Many are man only recognized what God had done. This recognition was both immediate and a process. Believers immediately used the books as they were written, but also took the task of recognition seriously and used wisdom. The need for a list became apparent as the promised false teachers showed up and their works needed to be excluded. There's a lot packed into that uh, sentence. So I'll just read it again and pick up on the key words of like recognition. Uh, that's a huge one. Just keep keying on that. I'll read it again. The church did not, de- did not determine, that's another key word, the church did not determine which books were inspired. God did. Man only recognized what God had done. So the statement would be Someone would say, well, the Roman Catholic Church picked the books in the Bible. The the Roman Catholic Church determined which books. No. God did. God is the one who inspired things. 
man only recognized what God had, did, had done. This recognition was both immediate and a process. Believers immediately used the books as they were written, but also took the task of recognition seriously and used wisdom. The need for a list became apparent as the promised false teachers showed up and their works needed to be excluded. So all of those, all of those commands throughout that we've been looking at, to, these warnings of, watch out, false teachers are going to show up. Well, they did. <laughs> the false teachers did show up, and they were writing scriptures, or writing things they were claiming uh, to be scriptures. And so what did the church do? They said, mm, those are not scriptures. These are. So because the false, promised false teachers showed up, that's what kind of kicked the church into gear to make uh, an official list, to say this is what is actually scripture. And all they were doing was recognizing what was scripture. They were not determining it. Here's some of the things that they looked for. Four things. This is kind of a brief explanation. Number one, was the book written by an apostle or a close associate? So every, every year, usually around Easter, you'll see you know, a Time magazine or something like that in the grocery aisle, and it'll be something dramatic. The lost books of the Bible. Well, those are the Gnostic Gospels. They're written, usually most of them are written from the 2nd to the 4th century uh, A.D., um, were the apostles alive then? No. They're like the Gospel of Tom, Thomas, the Gospel of Peter, uh, there's a whole list of them. The Gnostic Gospels were written after the apostles were dead. So one of the big questions in the 4th century when, this, when our canon was somewhat being made official by a list, that was the question. Were the apostles alive when that supposed book was written? If the answer was no, they tossed it. It was not uh, scripture. It may have had some value, just like you go to a Christian bookstore, you can find all, lots of good Christian books, but are those Christian books scripture? No. Uh, so that was one of the, the number one thing. Number two, was the book being accepted by the people of God at large? One of the main things, uh, great things that Jesus said was, my sheep will hear my voice. So were his sheep uh, accepting these new books as scripture? And the answer was no. His sheep were not listening to those as scripture. Uh, number three, did the book contain consistency of doctrine and orthodox teaching? So, one of the reasons why we today exclude the Book of Mormon and Doctrine and Covenants and Pearl of Great Christ from being included in this is because they don't have complementary doctrine, they have contradictory uh, doctrine. So when you're reading through and you're reading through Nehemiah and you get to the book of John, John does not contradict Nehemiah, he complements uh, Nehemiah. Whereas in Mormon theology and Mormon scriptures, uh, they contradict it. How do they contradict it? Well, first of all, it had the guns pointing at it, saying something's wrong with it, it's broken, and the new stuff is there to fix the problem. So this isn't a new thing. So they, the uh, early church asked that question, does this new book, does the Gospel of Thomas, does the Gospel of Peter, uh, contain consistency of doctrine and orthodox teaching? And they would say, no. It has all kinds of weird, weird stuff in it, so they would be them out as scripture. Number four, did the book bear the evidence of high moral and spiritual values that would reflect the work of the Holy Spirit? That's a big one. So, polygamy. They, the uh, LDS leaders have talked over the past that, that uh, God commanded polygamy. The Bible has a word for that. It's called adultery. Is polygamy in the Bible? Yeah. Uh, for some reason, there's times when God tolerated it, and he even gave commands on how the, those unfortunate women would be protected. But 100% of the time that God says something about polygamy in the Bible, it's negative. When he's talking about uh, uh, elders and the qualifications for elders in, in Titus and in 1 Timothy, the, one of the first qualifications is the husband of seven wives. No. <laughs> Husband of one wife. That's a qualification for elder slash bishop. Well, if you're in Utah in the 1800s, a bishop, would, a Mormon bishop, would have multiple 
line. So he'd be disqualified. He would fail uh, Deuteronomy 4.2 and adding to the scripture. He would fail uh, the Revelation, uh, the last chapter there, the last couple of verses, and adding to uh, the scriptures. So they would ask the question, did the book bear the evidence of high moral and spiritual values that would reflect, reflect a work of the Holy Spirit? An example of number three, I was kind of pointed this out earlier, but when you're looking at the Bible, each one of the books that's per, as Revelation is progressing and new scripture was being added, it, it complemented it. It revealed more uh, truth, but it was never contradictory. Kind of a worthy point. A lot of times when you're talking with them, is they'll bring up, like the Apocrypha, they'll say, well, what about the Apocrypha? Well, what about the, they wouldn't say Gnostic Gospels because that's, that's a pejorative term. They would say, well, what about the Gospel of Peter? What about the Gospel of Thomas? What about the lost books of the Bible? It's kind of a, a mute point. These are not, they don't actually think those are scripture either, but it's just a, it's just a, a smoke screen to get you over here to make you think, oh, well, maybe the canon is open and we should accept the Book of Mormon. They don't accept the Apocrypha either. They don't accept the, the Gnostic Gospels either. So when you look, if you grab one of their Bibles and you open up to the uh, table of contents, it has the same, same, uh, same books that ours has. The Joseph Smith translation, which was supposed to, which was translated supposedly to fix all of the problems, they don't use it today for obvious reasons because it's a complete mess. But you look at the table of contents and the Joseph Smith translation, same 66 books that we have. So just watch out for that. If you're talking about this subject and they ask, what about the Apocrypha? Just turn it back on them and say, well, do you think those are scripture? Then they'll say, well, no, I don't. Uh, so it's kind of a, a, mute, a mute point. So why, why do Bible-only Christians like us reject the LDS additional uh, scriptures? It's for similar reasons why the early church rejected all of those, uh, those things from the past. So here's some, uh, here's some reason, reasons. Major doctrinal differences. Major doctrinal differences. And so, like I was saying at the beginning of this message, the person that has already figured it out, the person who's already figured out that Joseph Smith is not who he claimed claim to be, the stuff that I'm going to give up bullet points for right now is stuff that they probably figured out. And, and so they already recognize that he's not who he was. So major doctrinal differences. The Book of Mormon and, and the following teach a different God, a different Jesus, a different spirit, a different gospel, and a different way to get to heaven. And they've probably already figured that out by now, so we'd say oh, this is the reason why we rejected this scripture. Uh, another thing, a consistent misuse of Bible passages to prove LDS teachings. We've looked at several of these, uh, but some, there's lots of them. John 10, 16, Jesus talks about other sheep. And so their question is, well, who are these other sheep that Jesus was came here to reach? And they'll have the Book of Mormon and say, well, the other sheep are the people in, in America. So Jesus not only came to Israel, but he also came uh, to the Americas and preached the gospel here. Well, that contradicts what the Bible says. The Bible says the other sheep are the Gentiles. That's just what it, what it teaches. You know, you keep, it, keep it everything in context. So it uses a Misuses Bible verses. John 10, 34, we looked at when Jesus said to the Pharisees, Ye are gods. They'll use that to say, See, the Bible teaches that men can become gods. No, 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 it doesn't. When you go through the context of it. Uh, James 1, 5, when it says, If you lack wisdom, ask God, and he gives to all liberal, liberally without reproach. And they say, See, we need to pray about the Book of Mormon, and God will tell you that it's true. Well, that's not what James 1.5 uh, is about. Ezekiel 37, 15 through 17 talks about two sticks, the stick of Judah and the stick of Ephraim, coming together as one, as an illustration. Uh, and they'll say, well, one stick is the Bible and the other stick is the Book of Mormon, and they are coming together as one. So they'll say that's a prophecy of the Book of Mormon and the Bible coming together in our, in our day. No, <laughs> it's not. All you have to do is read the passage, and the Israelites say, what does this illustration mean? And then you read further, and Ezekiel answers the question, that it's the, the northern kingdom of Israel, 
and to the southern kingdom of Israel, which at the time of writing were two separate nations, and then in the future, those two would become one. So you have the stick of Judah in the south, and the stick of Ephraim in the north, and eventually they would come together as one nation. So a constant misuse, of, or consistent misuse of Bible passages tells us that this new revelation is not true. And this is absolutely crucial. And I think I've done this before. You literally cannot do this without having a positively identified person, place, or thing from archaeology in the Bible. If I was to read Matthew chapter 6, there would be at least one thing that an archaeologist dug up and find. You would not be able to do this and not have something uh, positively uh, identified. With the Book of Mormon, you can't do that once. There's not one positively identified person, place, uh, or, or thing that's not already mentioned in the Bible. Like the Book of Mormon talks about Israel and Jerusalem, uh, Bethlehem, things like that. But you, no archaeologist is going to say, let's buy a plane ticket, we can go to Zarahemla. It's not going to happen. There's not a single page of the Book of Mormon with a positively identified person or place. So it's just not the same quality. It's not the same character. Easily demonstrated fraud. Over the next two Sundays, we're gonna, it will be kind of movie day. I'd say bring popcorn, but we're Baptists. So food's just not allowed in the sanctuary at Baptist churches. So <laughs> we've got to have a non-denominational church so we can just spray coffee all over the walls. <laughs> but we'll watch a movie. Uh, well, it's not really a movie. It's a documentary called The Lost Book of Abraham. And it's talking about uh, Joseph Smith um, uh, and his the scripture that he supposedly translated and said was the lost book of Abraham. And we'll see that it's easily demonstrated fraud. So we're kind of at the end. So let me summarize real quick. So reasons why to reject LDS scripture. And that our canon is closed. That our 66 books of the Bible are in. Number one, I'm suspicious of the motivation for requiring an open canon. And we've been warned. We've been warned of this throughout the Bible. Number two, with the desire for an open canon, I recognize an unawareness of how complete a story the Bible contains. It has the beginning, it has the middle, and it has the end. It's not missing anything. And number three, an open canon does not give LDS scripture a free pass. They fail the credibility tests uh, that individual Bible books pass with flying colors. Any quick questions? Because there's no one staring at me in the hallway, so any quick questions or comments? I, I, I know I didn't cover it that well. Yeah. So if you 
talk to someone that just wants to believe it, and I do this all the time, one of my hot topics is wax in the priesthood. Because prior to 